Good day, everyone, again. Thank you so much for joining us. And our prayer is that you're encouraged, that you're challenged, and that you're equipped to live lives that give glory and honour to our Lord Jesus Christ. Our passage today looks at some of the difficulties that communities and churches can face, issues around slander, quarrelling, division and disunity. And we don't want people to be struggling with these things. We don't want families to face these things. We don't want, as a church, to have to go through these kind of struggles and and challenges. Uh, And so this passage that we're looking at today has some challenging things to say, and we're looking forward to very much opening God's Word together. But first, I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer, so please pray with me. Dear Father in heaven, As it says in Psalm number 10, we thank you, Father, that you are a God who sees all things. Nothing escapes your eye. You do not forget the helpless. The wicked will not escape your judgment. You see the trouble of the afflicted, and you are the helper of the fatherless. Father, you consider their grief and take it in hand, and you listen to our cries. Father, you are the King, the one who rules forever and ever, and we praise you this day. Father, in in light of the passage that we're about to look at, we pray for ourselves and for all churches around the world that we would be a community, communities of peace and people unified under you. Father, when difficulties or disputes arise, please help us to study our hearts to analyse our motivations. Father, we pray that we would be humble people, seeking to exalt you above all and to serve one another. And Father, yet we also pray for all those around the world who are in distress because of divisions and disunity, victims of these things. And Father, we pray that they would find peace in you. We pray for our own denomination here and the wider church in Victoria, that we would be unified around the gospel and that we'd be unified around the centrality and the sufficiency of your word and and the truth that you reveal to us in it. And finally, Father, we pray for our church and our nation, particularly uh, for the months ahead and the difficult decisions that will be made. Father, we pray for the government for those in the medical field, for those on the grounds treating the sick, and also for those leading churches and and Christian organisations. Father, give all of those in these positions of of decision-making wisdom to make wise decisions, wise choices. Sustain them in the tiredness and the weariness that this pandemic has, has brought on so many. Father, please uphold them in your compassionate hands. Father, may these people consider the vulnerable. May they continue to serve and lay their lives down for the betterment of others. And Father, we pray too for each of us that we would be wise and godly in our thoughts, wise and godly in the words that we utter, in the words that we write and declare. And also in our actions, Father, may they be wise and godly and may we be humble. Help us to put aside our selfishness and our self-righteousness and help us to stand firm on the things that are important. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our reading today comes to us from James chapter 4, so please open up your Bibles to James chapter 4, and we're going to be reading uh, verses 1 to 3, and then also verses 11 and 12. James chapter 4. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You you desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives 
that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. And from verse 11, Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbour? Most school students will study Romeo and Juliet at some point at uh, school. And it's fresh in my mind at the moment as another one of our children has used uh, Romeo and Juliet for an English text this year. Uh, Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, it's not only a story about love, it's a story about conflict and the tragic conflict between two families. You know, that the play begins with this famous little uh, couple of lines. Two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona where we lay our scene, from ancient grudge break to a new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crust lovers take their life. Conflict between families is tragic. And so is conflict in the church. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15 says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace, and be thankful. Or Ephesians 4, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And yet, Christians sometimes uh, experience conflict and divisions and, and arguments. I'm hearing some awful stories at the moment that are coming out of the United States uh, where gospel-centered churches are being torn apart, pastors are resigning or being forced to leave and members leaving, congregations are dividing along political divides or social divides. It is extraordinarily dreadful. And we are seeing some of these kinds of arguments and fights beginning to bubble up here in Australia. Now, there are times when the gospel is at stake and we must say we cannot agree to disagree. Or we cannot remain in the church so long as the church doesn't believe in the, in the physical resurrection of Jesus or in the Trinity. Or if the church has drifted away from the Bible's teaching on marriage and sexuality or on other important moral issues where the Bible is very clear. But most arguments you see in churches are not about these big gospel beliefs. Church conflict is one of the concerns James addresses in his letter. Now this week we're going to be looking at chapter 4 verses 1 to 3 and then 10 to 12. And then next week, we're going to look at verses uh, 4 to uh, 10. But today we're going to consider these points, these three points. The nature of conflict, the root of conflict, and the outcome of conflict. James begins with the nature of conflict. Uh, in verse 1, there's a question he raises. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Now, the topic isn't how to deal with your arguments in the society in general, as it with the world, but how do we deal with disputes among believers? What causes fights and quarrels among you? There's an assumption here, isn't there, that these things do happen in the life of the church. Uh, what are some common examples of Christians arguing and quarreling? Uh, politics. At the moment, vaccines. Or how government rules are, are being orchestrated around the pandemic and how we should deal with them. Uh, sometimes, though, there is a clash of personality and so an argument comes about because of different personalities. Sometimes there's a misunderstanding. You know, we're just talking past each other rather than listening and engaging together. Sometimes an argument brews when there are people holding on to a different opinion on small things, just tiny little things. You know, the classic church examples are the color of the paint on the walls or the flower arrangements. Or if you've seen that the latest Crudes movie, uh, the Crudes is a cartoon family, and this movie is about a family who uh, are from the Stone Age, and they meet a modern day age, a family, a modern age family. 
And it becomes a bit like the, the Montagues and Capulets in Romeo and Juliet. Uh, although this time the argument is about something ridiculous. It's about bananas. Don't eat the bananas. Well, it's funny when these cartoon characters say it anyway. But, you know, the disputes sometimes are about really trivial things, small things. Other disc- uh, disagreements are more substantial. You know, occasionally we meet someone who just loves to argue. It's like it's their, their hobby. It's their favorite pastime. Now, they may be immature in the faith or really young in the faith, and so what they need is someone to get alongside them and disciple them. Or perhaps they are divisive, and that they are so self-assured and unable to hear what others feel and, and say. You know, Titus chapter 3 says, warn a divisive person once, warn them a second time, and after that have nothing to do with them. But James's choice of words here in verse 1 are pretty generic, and it includes all kinds of quarrels, from the smallest to pretty significant ones. Uh, In verse 11, look down to verse 11, James mentions a specific type of fighting. He talks about uh, slander. Look at verse 11. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Slander is a particularly ugly sin. Slander is a cowardly act where one often goes behind someone else's back and you stab them with words. See, slander is different from gossip. Gossip is another sin. Uh, Gossip gossip is a a loose word we speak about somebody else that causes distrust or that creates suspicion about somebody or a very negative view of somebody. Gossip is sometimes referred to as the respectable Christian sin. It's the bushfire of sins, though. Slander, however, is more intentional and more focused. It is the deliberate word of disdain towards someone that's intended to hurt or to harm that person's character or reputation. In his book, Taming the Tongue, Jeff Robinson has a helpful explanation. I've only flipped through the book and it seems a very helpful volume. And about slander, Robinson says this, Quote, slander is communicating damaging information about another person with the intention of smearing their character. In journalism, it's called malice of forethought. That is, telling a story, it can be either true or false, with the intent of causing harming another reputation. So slander is a form of verbal abuse. Often it's used to win an argument. It's a sinful power play that you're wanting to win the argument or you're wanting to get your own way. Did you know that the name devil means slanderer? So Satan himself was a slanderer, the devil, a liar from the very beginning. You know, in the Garden of Eden, he slandered God when he said to Eve, did God really say? He caused Eve to doubt God's good word. He caused Eve to stop trusting God and impugn God's character. You see, and when we slander somebody, whether it's in front of them or behind their back, whether it's on an uh, an email or on Facebook, we're not imitating Christ. We're copying the devil. Now, there are many other ways Christians quarrel. Sometimes we give the silent treatment. We might lie. We use angry words at one another, you know, a verbal uh, version of a boxing bout. We use words to hurt or to get our own way, maybe passive aggressively or aggressively. You know, we make threats. You need to do it my way or I'm going to leave the church. Do it my way or I'm going to stop giving money to the church. This must not be. Now, if you're listening in and you're thinking, wow, I've never experienced those kind of behaviors in a church before, wonderful, praise God. But many have had this experience or even have behaved in these ways. Now, the fact is, while these behaviors are sinful and they have no place among God's people, James knows, as he's writing, that it happens. He's bringing up the subject because it's happening to the people he's writing with too. Churches are not perfect communities. Friends, only Christ is perfect. That's why we need a saviour. You know, by definition, Christians are sinners, but we are sinners who admit it. 
and who are repenting and are trusting Jesus for forgiveness. And Christians are also, by definition, men and women who have that the Holy Spirit who's working in our lives, and he is making us more like Jesus. So yes, we do fail God, and we fail each other sometimes, but we should make progress. Our attitudes and our words should increasingly become more like the Lord Jesus. And I think that's what James is aiming for here. Now, what James does next, though, is to help us understand how these quarrels arise. He's opening the bonnet, so to speak, and getting us to look inside and looking at the mechanics of our hearts and the engines that are ruling us. That's our second point, the root of conflict. And so he asks, don't they come from desires that battle within you? So outward conflict comes about from inward desires. The outward fight is the result of desires battling within us. And now in verses 2 and 3, James gives us some examples. It's not uh, meant to be an exhaustive list. It's a sample range, if you like. Let me read those verses. Uh, Verse 2 and 3. You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. So he says we have inordinate desires. We covet. We ask with wrong motives. We want or we, uh, we crave. That's what the word means, we crave. Uh, apparently, any time I visit the supermarket, I come back with ice cream in the bag. I don't know how it works, you know, it's one of the great mysteries of life. I'm there to buy milk and yogurt, which I do, and I arrive home, and there's this, you know, ice cream as well. Or I've ducked down the woolies and and buying some potatoes and and meat, and again, I'm opening the bag at home, and and there's this ice cream. It's just amazing. Of course, it's not wrong to enjoy things in an appropriate way. But this idea of craving, though, is wanting something in a disproportionate way. And that idea of coveting. Coveting is about seeing someone who has something that you don't have, and you're wanting it, and you expect it, and you're trying to plot how to get it. And as James says, that can lead to killing. Literally, it does on occasionally lead to murder. More often, uh, we do and destroy a friendship or a person's reputation or gospel partnership because of of this coveting? That is because you're allowing the thing you desire to get in the way of that friendship or partnership. You're allowing this desire to matter more to you than the fellowship you once enjoyed. Have you ever wanted something from God and you haven't received it? Maybe you've asked, but you've asked with wrong motives, James says. Because the thing you want isn't desired in order to praise God and to love others. It's a selfish desire for you to have for yourself. Now, as James is observing, so often our arguments are not about what is right or good. We often like to, to paint them in that kind of picture that we are right in doing this, uh, we, we are good in doing this. You know, we might like to uh, justify even our really strong feelings, wrapping it up in all kinds of righteous language. It's like I'm tearing somebody apart, but I'm using the Bible. <laughs> no. It must not be. Claude uh, has a favorite toy at home. Claude, if you don't know, is our family greyhound. Uh, Contrary to rumours, he is not a horse. He is a dog. Anyway, Claude's favourite toy at the moment is a a teddy bear. It's one of the the children's old uh, teddy bears. And and Claude just loves to play with it. He throws his bear into the air and then he grabs it and then he slams it onto the ground and he digs his teeth in. (laughs) There's not much left of this teddy bear anymore. Uh, That The head is gone. Uh, The arms have been ripped off. It's pretty much just a blob of stuffing that he is slowly eviscerating. He just can't help himself. It's these instincts that he has, it's his desires to let rip, literally. And friends, that is so often what we do with relationships between brothers and sisters. When we allow something like envy or jealousy or pride to capture our heart, 
And we don't quickly nip it in the bud, but instead it begins to grow. This is what we can do to our relationships. Words are spoken. People are hurt. Now, when it comes to churches in James's day, of course, you couldn't leave your local church and find another one just down the road. As Christians do all the time these days, um, you know, things are kind of getting awkward for me. Uh, I think I'll just leave, go to another church. Or I don't like what was happening today. I'm just moving on. You couldn't do that in James's day. And what happens, you see, is that uh, when we have that attitude of not trying to repair, to repent, to restore, what we do, we often drag those unresolved issues from where we are into the new church. And eventually it follows us and it blows up again and the cycle continues. So in James's time, there was just that one church in town. And it meant you had to deal with quarrels and fights. You know, it's like being in the same family. Eventually you have to sit down and talk about it and confess, and repent, and forgive, and reconcile. And friends, that is how we grow as Christians. This is how we glorify God. This is how we show the world the difference Jesus makes. Check your hearts. Consider your words and actions. Ask, what is motivating me? And then thirdly, the outcome of of conflict. Uh, The story of Romeo and Juliet begins with this family feud. Two families are at loggerheads with each other. And and, and so when this girl and and a boy fall in love, one from each of the families, right? for a few days it looks like maybe there'll be a breakthrough. Maybe here's a point of connection. Maybe these two families can, can come back together again. But of course, instead, what happens is that there are two boys killed. Then Romeo dies and then Juliet. It's a tragedy. You see, in verses 11 and 12, James is wanting the churches to understand God does not take divisiveness lightly. He writes from verse 11, anyone who speaks against a brother or sister and judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? James here is is, uh, going back to, to something that he's been reminding the readers of repeatedly in this letter. We are brothers and sisters. And he also adds here, and we are neighbors. That is, we are living in close relation to one another. We, we have shared responsibilities toward each other. And when uh, James talks about the law in verses 11 and 12, he might be referring to the Old Testament law in general. I think more likely what he's talking about is the summary of the law, which we find both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, this is something that Jesus affirmed. You know, love the Lord your God with all your, your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And so what James is saying is that these quarrels fail God's standards, and they are a failure to love. They are a failure to love God, but they are a failure to love our neighbor. And will not God judge us for breaking his law of love? as we judge others and look down on others, are we not breaking God's law and that God will turn it around and judge us? But notice in verse 12, while uh, there's a right emphasis there as, uh, with God judging, James also says, and he saves. See, the, the wonderful thing about Christianity is that the rightful judge is also the saviour. God judges sin and God saves its sinners. Now, how could God do both things? Well, the answer is the cross. The judgment that was reserved for me and for all of the wrong uh, the words I have spoken, and all of the ugly desires I have, they were taken by Jesus for me. And he died on the cross in my place. You know, one of the, the things that we learn about the cross, as Jesus hung there, all kinds of words were thrown at him. Lies and slander and malicious rumors and insults. 
And he didn't retaliate. In love for his father and in love for us, he persevered even to death on a cross. The judge saves. Very few disputes are going to be on the magnitude of Martin Luther's famous words when he said, Here I stand, I can do no other. Those days do occur, but they are pretty rare. Most often we fight, we quarrel, we divide in churches between Christians because we want what we don't have. Or because we envy somebody else. Or we love our preferences more than we love others. Now, it's not a sin to have a different opinion on disputable matters. It is, however, a sin for us to be dividing over them and to walk away from friendship and fellowship. Here's some advice. When there is disagreement, first of all, decide if it's a matter that needs to be discussed or not. Second, if not you have a responsibility to let it go and not allow it to cause conflict. Third, if you believe it should be raised, then do so with the relevant personal persons. Don't turn to gossiping and getting other people invited and and dividing friendships and so forth. Speak to the person or persons concerned. Speak with gentleness, speaking truth, Stick to the issue, don't get personal, and listen well as well. Just in case you are the one who is at fault, or you are the one who has misunderstood. And then fourthly, remember what we share in common. Not only the disagreement, but remember the gospel, and do everything to keep the unity of the body. Resolving conflict is not always easy, It's not always quickly fixed. Now, our church has a grievance policy that should be followed uh, when these sort of circumstances arise, when a disagreement or a dispute comes about. We urge you to, uh, to follow the grievance policy. And with every fiber and God's strength, we must resolve not to allow fights and quarrels to take hold of us. For the sake of the unity of Christ's body, For our own good. I mean, listen to the contrast that James makes at the end of chapter 3 between friction and peace. Which is the better one? Which is the path that we want to take? Listen. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere, Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. For the sake of the unity of Christ's body, for our own good, we need to deal with uh, disputes, with disagreements, with godliness. And also for the sake of uh, our witness to unbelievers. I mean, why would a non-Christian in Melbourne today be interested in Jesus or ever want to turn up to church if all they see Christians doing are fighting or and arguing and hurting others and complaining all the time? If we are no different to the streets of Melbourne, why would anyone ever want to come in and investigate Christ? It's such a poor testimony. But if they can see us, yes, at times disagreeing, but then forgiving each other and serving one another and living in peace, that is a wonderful witness. And it is a testimony Melburnians are desperate to see. You know, Jesus said, the world will know that you are mine because you love one another. Friends, love one another. And when we fail or when we fall short, and friends, our words sometimes do fall short, let's speak a new word. Please forgive me. I forgive you. Let me pray.
Our Father in heaven, we want to acknowledge before you that there are times, some that we remember, others that we have forgotten, but nonetheless have taken place. There are times when uh, we fight and quarrel, when we hurt others with our words and with our actions, when we gossip, when we slander, when we become angry. Father, please, uh, please forgive us. For the sake of your Son, please forgive us and, and change us by your Spirit. Father, help us to persevere with one another in love and with gentleness and kindness to live at peace. Father, when there are different points of view, help us to, to deal with them with great um, yeah, love and grace. We pray that uh, you will keep us from falling. We pray that you will keep us from uh, mimicking the, the devil, but instead help us to, uh, to be more like the Lord Jesus. And Father, as we relate to one another, we pray that those who are looking in might see the reality of Christ and to see that this community is different. And it's different in a wonderful way, in, a, in an attractive way. And instead of dividing and hating and slandering and speaking ill, they are forgiving, they are loving, they are serving one another. They speak kindly. And Father, we pray that this may more and more be us here at Mentone Baptist Church. And we pray that for our good and for your glory. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.